Well, welcome to the Middlesex Moments radio show. This is Anna Wasesha, the president of Middlesex Community College, proud to be the president of this great college here in Middletown, Connecticut. And today, my guest is Steve Kravisky, and today's show is our annual Looking Ahead at the baseball season 2016, because Steve knows more about American baseball than anybody I've ever met in my entire life. Uh, Yeah, well, you're welcome. So we could start with the projections for who you think would make it to the World Series. I realize the data isn't, the data are not in, data is a plural word, but there's got to be a sense of who might end up. And then at the end of the summer, as we come through the World Series, we can come together again in the radio station program here and then look backward and see how your prediction stood the test of the season. Okay. Yeah, so what do you, what do you think? What, who will be playing for the American League and the National League? And Well, I'm going to start with the National League first because prior to the start of the season, A lot of people thought that this could be the Chicago Cubs year. So far, they've they've been doing very well. They have the best record in baseball so far. And in that division, they have a substantial lead over the Cardinals and Pirates. So if you went by best record, you'd have to favor the Cubs in the National League. Although, as a lot of our listeners might know, The team with the best record doesn't always win. There's a number of examples about that. In the American League, I don't think there's really a clear favorite. The Red Sox have done very well, primarily because their core of young players, Bogart, Spets, and Bradley, have done very well. I'm skeptical about their pitching, and I think since the trading deadline is coming up July 31st, that's still a ways off, but... There will be a lot of talk about deals being made. Uh, In the Central Division, Kansas City, last year's defending champions, have struggled. And it remains to be seen if they can get back to their excellence of the last couple of years. Uh, The White Sox got off to a good start and they've fallen back. The Indians are doing well with, I think, a lot of probable no-names. In the West, Texas and Seattle have done well. I don't think there's really a clear favorite in the American League. Listeners, since this is the New England area, might favor the Red Sox, but they have at times gotten off to good starts and faltered in the past. Uh, Texas has kind of been under the radar, and they got Cole Hamels from the Phillies last year, who's a top-level pitcher, and I think you do need an ace to get through the postseason, which would help teams like Uh, San Francisco, the Giants have Bumgarner, and since this is an even-numbered year, the Giants have won the last three World Series in even-numbered years. If you want to talk about statistical trends that I could probably use in my math classes in the fall, that that's something to think about. The Dodgers have Kershaw, but the Dodgers are trailing, although the only race that's really not close is in the Cubs division in the Central. I know, Anna, you're a big Cardinals fan, Mm -hmm. uh, but the Cardinals have some work to do. So do the Minnesota Twins. Uh, Yes, (laughs) that's unfortunate that uh, the Twins are not doing very well for a number of reasons. And I just found out that one of their pitchers, Phil Hughes, a former Yankee who wasn't doing very well, just got hurt. So there's just sort of been a disaster for the Twins. I was on the phone with... One of my friends who's a Twins fan, I was playing him in my fantasy league, and he was kind of bemoaning the Twins' problems because last year they were a pretty decent team, and this year, unfortunately, they've fallen back. There are so many variables that go into, you know, whether or not a team is going to win games. So we'll talk about that, but uh, we have to take a break, and when we come back, I'm curious about the dark horse teams, maybe because the Twins to me seems like a dark horse team but some that look like they might have the prospect to rise. So we'll be right back after this message. Well, we're back to Middlesex Moments Radio Show, the annual look forward to the baseball season, although it's underway. Steve Kravisky, a math professor here at Middlesex, but also the most knowledgeable person in the world about baseball. So where we left off before was the dark horse team. So are there some just miserable teams that look like they might possibly rise uh, to the uh, competition level that the others in their league have and, and maybe prevail, maybe, you know, win? Well, one example of that is the renaissance of uh, the Washington Nationals, who had a lot of problems last year. They're in first place in the National League East. 
and uh, Steven Strasburg, their ace pitcher, is doing very well. And also they have last year's uh, reigning National League MVP in Bryce Harper, who is not having a great year by his standards, but he's being walked a lot. There was a game earlier this year when Bryce Harper was walked six times, which ties a major league record uh, set by Jimmy Fox and equaled by a couple of other people. So the Nationals renaissance, partly because of a new manager, Dusty Baker, who'd managed for other teams, I think could make them a threat. So even though the Cubs have the better record, uh, the best team in the regular season doesn't always win in the postseason. So I think you'd have to look at the Nationals at this point. The Mets have the pitching with all the young hurlers, uh, Syndergaard, DeGrom, Matt Harvey, and others. Their offense at times is a little suspect, but it's possible that the Mets could make a run having been in the World Series last year. Over in uh, the Central, if uh, and if your Cardinals get it together, that's a possibility. And um, the, the Pirates' young pitcher, uh, Ty on yesterday, it, T-A-I-L-L-O-N, pitched like a three-hit shutout against the Mets over eight innings yesterday in only a second start. So the Pirates have been a little disappointing, but if they have a good second half, they could be considered. And then there's the Giants, you know, with that even year s syndrome, and maybe the Dodgers if they got on a roll, because as long as you've got someone like Kershaw, who's been a tremendous pitcher over the last five or six years, that's a possibility. In the American League, you'd have to think about Texas, who was in the World Series in 2010 and 11, losing the dramatic series in 11 against your Cardinals. I remember that. You know, the, the Cardinals were like one strike away from losing two or three different times, and they came back. But Texas seems to be on the upswing, so that's a possibility. Seattle's having a good year. Uh, whether they can sustain that remains to be seen. Um, Seattle, like Toronto, is an expansion team from 1977. But Toronto has a lot of offense. In that division, the East, the Red Sox, Orioles, and Blue Jays all have very strong offenses. So um, the problem with a lot of those teams is I think the pitching is a little suspect. And so that'll relate to what happens at the trading deadline. I'm afraid to say my Yankees have a lot of problems, and uh, I've been commiserating with uh, my fellow Yankee f fan friends, some of whom are, of course, here on campus. And um, I don't see the Yankees being a, a real challenger. There's a lot of work to do because of some bad contracts. But I think it's a matter of getting hot at the right time going into the playoffs. And if any of the teams like Baltimore, Boston, Toronto, or Texas, let's say, generate some, some more pitching, that could, that could carry them to the top. Because last year, at the trading deadline, Toronto got David Price from Detroit and Troy Tulowitzki from Colorado. And Price, as an ace, you know, was, it was a big catalyst to get Toronto into the postseason. So I look for deals to put somebody over the top. So when is the trading deadline? July 31st. Oh, they have a long time yet. Yes, that's right. And so some teams are going to have to decide, I guess, in the language I've been reading about, are they buyers or are they sellers? Can you just, you know, imagine that you know nothing about trading. As I would say, I know nothing about trading. What? Ha how does it work? How does it just walk us through the process. Okay, well, the way it works is that as you get closer to the end of July, like a, let's say if a team, let's say take the Chicago Cubs, if they were to decide that they have a need in a certain area, then they would be looking around to see could they make a trade with another team to fit a need that let's say the Cubs have. Is it always so, a bilateral trade or are there sometimes... Well, ideally it should be bilateral, but there is a history in general that trades could involve three teams. So there, there is that possible scenario. So if the Cubs, let's say, felt that they needed bullpen help, and if, let's say, if the Yankees are out of the race by then, then the Yankees might say, well, okay, we've got 
Betances, Miller, and Chapman at the back end of our bullpen, which is good if the Yankees can ha- turn the lead over to them, which hasn't happened often enough. So if the Cubs were to say, okay, we need it, we need somebody to close for us, they might say to the Yankees, would you be willing to make a deal? And then the Yankees would be looking for good young prospects, especially position players. So if there's a fit, then a trade good could be made right around that time. And similarly, if let's say the Red Sox were to say they think they need another starter, since certain people like Buckholz, who has a lot of talent, uh, haven't really delivered, then the Cubs might, rather than the Red Sox, rather might say, well, if they're talking to a team that has starting pitchers, then the Red Sox might say, well, we've got some good young position players. I mean, they're not going to trade Bogart, Betts, or Bradley, but they might look to, to trade somebody else in exchange for help somewhere else. Is this all done in the QT? I mean, does a manager call a manager, or how do they yeah, do Yeah, there's often phone calls usually actually involving the general managers. I mean, I would think the manager should give input. So, for instance, if Joe Girardi, the Yankee manager, were to say to his general manager, Brian Cashman, I need help in the following areas, primarily offense and getting Yankees getting younger and more athletic, then Cashman would be looking around to say, um, okay, we we could trade you, let's say, someone from our bullpen in exchange for help somewhere else. Is there money that changes hands? There can be in some cases. Now, what's also different about that as opposed to other trades is that there's also an August 31st deadline involving what's called waivers, waiver deals. That's different because... If I just heard, for instance, that Jose Reyes, who had been a star with the Mets and other teams, and who was under suspension for an alleged domestic violence issue, might be released by Colorado. So um, if Colorado were to put him on waivers, then somebody could claim him. But that happens by August 31st. So by July 31st, it would be more a matter of two teams or maybe a third team trading because there's a need that each team figures that another team could could meet. And then there's no going back on that. Then then going into to the remainder of the season, they have to stick with the players on their roster, right? Yeah, in other words, if you don't make a deal by that July 31st trading deadline, then yes, you have to stick with what you've got. Now, you might put somebody on waivers in August to see if somebody will claim them. But then if it's someone you really wanted to keep, you'd pull the player back. Now, another factor that could affect the pennant races is that on September 21st, rather on September 1st, the rosters expand from 25 to 40. So that means that since the minor league season usually ends in early September, then after September 1st, a given team can call up players from their minor league roster. Now, subject to the fact that if their top farm teams are in the, in the playoffs, they might be careful about who they recall. But a September call-up, when the rosters expand from 25 to 40, could make a difference if somebody who's having a good minor league season comes up and gives the team like a shot in the arm. That could make a difference also. Do all the major teams have farm teams? So yeah, the, the, the old, like let's say the Red Sox have Pawtucket and Rhode Island. The Yankees, for instance, Grant and Wilkes-Barre in Pennsylvania. So yes, all the major league teams have farm teams. The, the top minor league leagues would be the International League and the Pacific Coast League. So there's like triple A, double A, single A, rookie level and stuff like that. So ideally... Your top farm team should be close by, but there are exceptions. So, for instance, the New Britain Rock Cats were for a long time the, the Twins. Yes, your team. exactly. You know, and people like David Ortiz, uh, Justin Morneau, Tory Hunter, and, and oh, others. Oh, was Tory Hunter on the Rock Cats? For yeah, at one, oh. at one point. So, a, lo- a lot of the Twins players who helped them win came through the Rock Cats. Now then. 
the affiliation changed last year, then they became the Colorado Rockies farm team. And that kind of thing seems strange to me because if you want to call somebody up or send somebody down, you think you'd want your farm team close by. But the affiliations do change from time to time. We need to take another break, and when we come back, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about statistics in baseball. Okay, good. good. Well, we're back to the Middlesex Moments Radio Show, the 2016 look forward at the baseball season, and Steve Kravisky, our local expert on baseball, but also baseball and statistics. So earlier you were saying that the Giants had won the, the series on even-numbered years, so three times in across six years. But what do you make? How do you make any meaning out of that? And and how how what is the role of a relationship between statistical analysis of baseball and strategic decisions? We were just talking about trading partners. I mean, is there a phenomenally powerful role that statistics plays there for the people who are making those decisions? Oh, good question. Within the realm of my Saber Group, Society for American Baseball Research, a lot of people like. The notion of what's called sabermetrics, using math and statistics to analyze baseball players and teams. Uh, uh, that, and that phrase was coined by um, Bill James going back to the 1980s, who also worked for the Red Sox for several years. A lot of front offices are using analytics and various statistical measures to, to evaluate their players. And I think in terms of what you said about the Giants, that sometimes a team wins a championship when a lot of things come together for them. For instance, the 2013 Red Sox had a lot of things break right for them, you know, with people like Napoli and Victorino and some others. But that really turned out to be a fluke because then they dropped sharply the next couple of years while they waited for their younger players to bloom, which has started to happen. So I think in this era with free agency, players move around so much that sometimes it can be hard to keep track. You know, in the old days, if you think about like my growing up with like Mickey Mantle and the Yankees and some of our listeners with the Red Sox or Mets or other teams, you know, if you followed it closely, you could probably name every starting player on every team going way back. Now with all the new faces and call-ups and stuff like that, it is really harder to keep track. Plus, there's twice as many teams as there used to be. Now, if you look at the Giants, you know, their, their ace is Madison Bumgarner, who was really outstanding in relief two seasons ago against Kansas City. He had won, he had won this previous start. And then the Giants brought him into relief for five innings, and he was able to shut Kansas City down, and that was a long relief stint. But I think some, sometimes players peak for short periods of time. You'd have to take into account injuries, like what happened to Tim Lincecum, who won two Cy Young Awards, and then he seemed to disappear. So there's a lot of factors involved, and so... I think statistics can be helpful if you look at, um, like more recently, people like what's called OPS, on-base average plus slugging, which I have mixed feelings about because I think it's adding overlapping quantities. But there are some newer statistics or like stuff like batting average on balls in play, BABIP, B-A-B-I-P. There's all sorts of newer numbers out there so that um, the modern statisticians tend to discredit the old statistics like batting average or uh, pitchers' wins, which is kind of a mixed bag. So, Does every team have a statistician? Yeah, either probably on their staff or there's stuff like the Elias Sports Bureau in New York. So I think every team now is probably using some form of analytics to not only look at what they have at the major league level, but also to consider from the scouting perspective, what do they have in the farm system? Uh, Are their players ready to produce? One of the things that can, of course, tilt things in different direction would be injuries. One of the ways that that affected the Yankees was that last couple of months in 2015, the Yankees called up Greg Bird, a left-handed hitting first baseman, because 
the regular Mark Teixeira, who had been doing well, got injured, which has been an ongoing problem. Bird did very well in those last couple of months. And then in spring training, he got hurt and he's out for the year. So you can't really predict how that could affect the team's fortunes, that um, injuries occur, uh, to what extent does age have an impact, because some of the key Yankee players have gotten old. They don't have the young position players that the Red Sox have. And so you'd have to think about those kinds of questions. And so what that relates to is if you think about a team planning ahead, do they want to give a long-term contract to somebody? A couple of years ago, uh, Robbie Cano, who's now on Seattle and having a good bounce back year, left the Yankees and he they uh, Seattle gave him a 10-year contract. Now, to me, I don't particularly like that sort of thing. The Angels did the same with Pujols, who'd been a star with your team, the Cardinals. Now, both of them were over 30 already, which for, you know, baseball, when you get to 35, that's considered old. So I think in terms of, again, that analytic statistic aspect, do you want to give a long-term contract to a player who, however good they've been, if they're already over 30, you're not going to get 10 years out of them? You know, and I, if I were a GM, I personally would not give more than three years to somebody. Now, one of the things that's going to come up that'll affect projections is Bryce Harper is going to be a free agent in 2018. He's currently with the Washington Nationals. So it would it be a good idea in terms of analytics and long-term strategy for, let's say, the Nationals to lock him up or Steven Strasburg when they're still in their 20s, as opposed to saying if they don't want to spend the money, they're going to be in a bidding war in a couple of years. And then is it a good idea for a team like the Yankees who needs younger, stronger players to spend all that kind of money on Bryce Harper. So I think the terms of thinking about analytics, do you want to you want to give out contracts to people like that? So I think those are some things that our listeners might want to think about. Do people ever walk away from a contract or are they really they're, they're sort of forced to if for example the Washington Nationals if he, they had a player on a 10-year contract, would, would they have to continue to play? How does that work? Well, with some of the longer contracts, um, there, there, are, there are opt-out provisions in the contract. Okay. In fact, both A-Rod and Sabathia, whose contracts expire next season, 2017, they exercised this opt-out provision, which ended up getting them a whole lot more money. But then, So there might be a penalty if you opt out, but then you could make more money. Yeah, some of that depends on how your contract is structured. So uh, does the team want to allow such a provision to be in the contract? And is it a good idea to allow for that kind of opting out? And do you want to give, again, from that analytics perspective, do you want to give a long-term contract to somebody? In fact, the aforementioned Bill James, who pioneered a lot of statistical ideas, you know, once claimed that based upon the work he did, that a lot of baseball players peak at the age at age 27. Oh, that's so, a lot earlier than 35. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So, for instance, Stan Musial, one of your favorites, had a tremendous season in 1948 when he turned 27 in the off season because he led the National League in just about every significant category and missed by one of leading in home runs, which would have given him the triple crown. So now Musial had other good years later on. The really good ones will play well into their thirties. But do you want? Do, what do you what What do you do in terms of when the players are getting older? Then what do you do in terms of keeping them? You know, it's a little like horse racing. But the fact is, these are human beings. You know, and people like Stan Musial. Uh, were really important to the city of St. Louis. I mean, they were personalities, and they were involved in social groups. And so, you know, they, they, they made the place a better place to live yeah. because it be, there was a lot of pride in having him be part of the town. And so it's, it seems like there's got to be a human dimension on a team. And it's kind of sad in a way that these people can be, you know, moved around like 
pieces on a game board when in fact they probably a team has to work together a team they have to gel and and uh, be able to I- infer what somebody else might be saying to them or, or signaling signaling to them so that they can make the right choices because of these sort of instant choices they always have to make uh, and so how does how do they do that I mean how does does the man is it the manager's responsibility to get that team to be cohesive I think that's a good point in terms of the non-statistical, um, you're right, the human side of the game. Because, you know, sometimes there's a lot said about clubhouse chemistry and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Last year, one of the reasons the Washington Nationals struggled in spite of having Bryce Harper and Strasburg was that I think there were some issues with clubhouse chemistry and the manager, Matt Williams, who had been a good player in his career, didn't seem to be a good fit. So there were some problems in the clubhouse in the dugout, and that was, I think, those were reasons why the Nationals weren't that good. This year with the new manager and things seeming to be better, then they're in first place in the East and there'll be a team to be reckoned with. So I think your point is well taken that I like statistics as a numbers person, and my students know that I use it all the time with, like I try to teach them about Yankee uniform numbers like Ruth plus Gehrig equals Mantle, for instance. I got a worksheet about that. But there is that, you're right, there is that intangible side of things that if players are unhappy with each other, if the clubhouse isn't functioning, then then that could definitely be a problem. You can have the talent, but if the talent doesn't gel, then they're not going to be in the postseason. That's right. So I'm afraid we've come to the end of this program, but we'll come back in September talk about the World Series. In the meantime, though, I want to thank you, Steve, for being the guest on the program today and encourage everybody to, to watch baseball. Uh, it's a great game. It's the American pastime, right? And, and I'll keep an eye on the Washington Nationals. I want to thank you all for joining us today. And this is Middlesex Moments Radio Show. Uh, Anna Wasesha wishing you all a very good day.